Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles is a game I've held near and dear to my heart since I played it on the GameCube when I was a 13-year-old loser. It was a really weird game to recommend to people, seeing as you needed four Game Boy Advances, four Link cables, a GameCube, a copy of the game, and four memory cards if the other players had their own character from their copy of the game. And this is assuming your friends are okay with sitting in front of a big CRT for hours upon hours over multiple play sessions and actually enjoy spending time with you. Mine didn't. Needless to say, the barrier to entry was about as thick as Wall Maria. So for many, including myself, Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles was a single-player experience, with the multiplayer component being something of a pipe dream. When I found out Crystal Chronicles would be remastered for the Switch and PS4, I basically coomed once I learned it would have online play, remastered graphics, re-recorded musical tracks, and extra endgame content. It felt sort of like if you were a big Dot .hack or Sword Art Online fan, and suddenly Bandai Namco announces they'll be making a virtual reality MMO in that respective universe where you can eat, sleep, and bump uglies in a shiny high fantasy universe. Okay, I might be exaggerating just a little bit, but you get the picture. I was fucking excited, man. Let's get the boys together and rid the world of miasma with our glorious crystal caravan, I thought. I told all of my friends, and just linking them the entire soundtrack on YouTube was good enough for most people to be like, hell yeah, I'll play that shit. Then it got delayed. Then it got delayed again, and I started to get worried. So, I'm in kind of a tough spot because I love this game to an unreasonable degree. Like, I completely acknowledge the flaws in both the original and the remake, but I also really adore the atmosphere and world building and soundtrack, so I'm gonna go over some of the bad stuff with the remake, and then I'm gonna basically fillet the core game to a ridiculous extent. Also, I'll be spoiling a bunch of the game if you wanted to get into it, but I'll be easing into it if you feel like stopping the video and picking it up yourself. So, if you don't want to have anything ruined for you, it's on PS4 and Switch, and you've had 17 years to play it, so I don't want to hear about it. It. Anyway, Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles was a 2003 real-time RPG with four-player local co-op in which players can either go solo or team up with friends to adventure into the outside world in a quest to rid the world of a dangerous poisonous miasma of unknown origins, while temporarily keeping it at bay by defeating bosses guarding crystal trees and gathering their myrrh with which to renew the miasma-repelling crystal at the core of every major town, including the player's hometown of Tippa. The main appeal with Crystal Chronicles, as mentioned in the introduction, is it having a four-man squad of people and setting out on a grand adventure in a caravan while receiving letters from your worried and adoring family and simultaneously encountering beautiful and genuinely harrowing experiences alike is such a novel concept to the extent that it's basically never been attempted or accomplished before or since. So it comes as no surprise that people were fucking pissed when it turned out the multiplayer was region locked and to add insult to injury, the original multiplayer functionality from the GameCube version was gutted. Remember when I said you could invite people to your caravan? They'd literally move into your town and be your neighbors, and every year their family's affection would level up, and their services would subsequently improve as well. So you could have a blacksmith in your town to make people's armor, an alchemist to make people's blueprints, a merchant to sell bulk goods for gill, and otherwise have a thriving economy, all augmented by the player's ability to share items between one another. You'd adventure on the overworld map and encounter unlikely allies, and visit towns to upgrade your gear and sell treasure. Except they literally removed all of that and made it so that you can only play laggy online matches with people in dungeons and then you all get booted out by the end of it, which were all concessions mandated by the game being ported to Android and iOS, which is totally a win for mobile gaming. Region locking means I couldn't play with any of my patrons who are all based in Germany, the UK, and the Netherlands. And even if I could, they'd still only experience half of what made the game so good. It also opens up the possibility of griefing, as whoever is holding the chalice is able to just steamroll the entire level, with the party being forced to come along as they'll either die standing in the miasma or get teleported to the chalice after straying too far, which happened to me once and was equal parts aggravating and kind of hilarious. Speaking of aggravating, why should video editing be? I recently released an entire video breaking down how to use Adobe Premiere Pro, but not everyone wants to learn a robust video editing program and instead just want to use a quick and easy solution for capturing and doing basic edits for gameplay footage. If this sounds like something you'd be interested in, then I'm happy to say that Wondershare Demo Creator is the product for you. With Demo Creator, you're able to record high-quality PC footage in a number of resolutions and frame rates, and once you're done, you can use Demo Creator to also edit the footage and apply a number of features, such as chroma key, custom titles, text, stickers, professional looking transitions, mosaic blurs, cinematic bars, cursor highlights, 
sounds, and much more. If you're interested, check out the links in the video description to try out the free demo or purchase a license. And thanks to Wondershare for helping to support the channel. But without further ado, let's talk about the music. Now I might describe some of these inaccurately since I'm no musical academic and I'm merely taking guesses, as this is the first time I've seen most of these instruments. So if I get any of these wrong, then I encourage you to correct me. But most of the music is all centered around a large selection of tonally similar sounding ancient instruments, such as the crumb horn, which is a congested sounding wind instrument that gives a medieval texture. The racket, which is a tiny little horn that sounds very similar to the crumb horn, but with warmer, bassier notes. The shawm, which is an oboe-esque wind instrument that peaked in the Middle Ages and was eventually eclipsed and superseded by the oboe. The recorder, which has the properties of a piccolo without being quite as shrill. The serpent, which is a brass instrument whose name becomes apparent upon seeing the instrument itself and sounds like a gentle trumpet. The cornet mute, which almost sounds like a toy trumpet thanks in part to the miniature size mixed with the metallic mechanism known as the mute, which fits in the main opening and uses a metal piece known as a stem, which subsequently makes it sound more muffled. The portative organ, which sounds like a mixture between an organ and bagpipes, and I didn't realize just how small it is for being an organ. The gems horn, which is a horn-shaped wind instrument that sounds very similar to an ocarina. The bagpipe, which is, you know exactly what a fucking bagpipe sounds like. The psaltery, which is a plucked stringed instrument often played on one's lap or on a table. The bowed psaltery, which is a longer version played with a bow, as the name might suggest. The centaur, which is an Iranian hammered dulcimer, which uses two feather-light hammers known as mezrabs, which produces tones that sound uncannily like a mixture between a piano and a harp. The baglama, also known as a saz, which is a long-necked lute that sounds like equal parts guitar and sitar, and seems proficient at producing what I like to refer to as desert music. Speaking of desert music, the hurdy-gurdy is one of the coolest instruments I've ever seen, which I knew nothing about before researching for this video, and found out it's an incredibly unique instrument which can accomplish a lot with a luber pedal, as this clip will clearly show. Daf is a Persian combination of a tambourine and maracas, which may be shaken and struck to create a very unorthodox percussive sound. The lute, which is a 24-stringed guitar capable of producing darker, more resonant notes. The Renaissance guitar, which is a small instrument that preceded the classical five-string guitar we know today, and is smaller than a lute despite sounding quite similar. And 
And the tendrum is one of these. I wish I could learn more, but the internet seems to know nothing about it aside from it being a Japanese drum, which seems to be the taiko drum, but it's a drum. That's about the extent of my understanding. Point being, the compositions of this game are all centered around a very similar sounding pool of musical instruments used in the Middle Ages and other ancient cultures in the distant past, but how Kumi Tanioka uses them is nothing short of genius. So instead of breaking down the precise instrumental makeup of each track, I'll focus more on the tone and how it complements the atmosphere, while taking some guesses as to what I think the instruments may be. If you're interested in the way the music sounds, I highly recommend looking up the soundtrack for the 2004 MMORPG Final Fantasy XI, which was scored by Naoshi Mizuta, with Tanioka composing some select tracks primarily in the base game, and makes use of very similar instruments to lend an amazingly unique and memorable atmosphere to one of my favorite worlds of all time. I'd play it, but it's all copyrighted, so if you're interested, I've left a link to the OST's playlist in the video description with some of my favorite tracks. Also, I should briefly mention that I've gotten back into Final Fantasy XI and I'm working on a very long-winded video talking about everything it does well. So if you're interested in experiencing one of the most atmospheric and beautiful MMOs in our lifetime, I encourage you to at me on Twitter if you want help setting it up and getting invited to our link shell, as I'm already having an absolutely amazing time and I'd love the chance to play it with my subscribers. As they just added new content earlier this year and the player base is still very active and friendly towards newcomers. Not to mention this fucking 16-year-old MMO could have the server shut down any year, and I wanted one last chance to revisit one of my favorite virtual worlds of all time with any willing friends, so I encourage you to consider my invite. But with that being said, let's talk about the soundtrack. The title screen song Echo of Memories is a somber, eerie melody with only four bell notes that gradually increases in volume before fading out, which hints at the ominous truth the player will eventually discover at the ends of the earth and will be reincorporated verbatim later on. The opening piece that plays as you begin the game, Morning Sky, is sung by Donna Burke, who also narrates the background story fables to the player as they enter areas. She also voiced Angela Orozco from Silent Hill 2, as well as Claudia Wolf from Silent Hill 3. But most, if not all of her fans, will know her for two main things, which is the voice of the iDroid AI from Metal Gear Solid 5, but most notably the vocalist for the meme-worthy song Sins of the Father, which most people know from the chorus. <laughs> Morning Sky is truly fantastic, as it sets up a nostalgic, adventurous tone to hype up the player for a grandiose tale of ambition and bravery with lyrics to match. The strong percussion gives a driving force necessary to motivate oneself to dive into danger with no reservation. Throughout the song, the player will see the crystal caravan preparing to leave and waving goodbye to their loving families, while also emphasizing the importance of the town crystal, which will eventually be shown to keep the miasma at bay and keep the player's family safe. People were understandably upset when they found out it was re-recorded and Burke changed up the tempo by adding syncopation to the rhythm, but it didn't bother me too much. Namely because while the original track was amazing, I could imagine myself being a composer and saying, the tempo is too robotic, let's like spice it up a bit. The overworld theme, Today Arrives, Becoming Tomorrow, is unfortunately pretty obnoxious and you'll be hearing it a lot the more time you spend on the main menu. It's just a very repetitive and tedious sounding recorder track. The Riverbell Path theme, Departure, is a nice relaxing introduction to the first and easiest level of the game, with some introductory strumming preceding some gentle strings playing beneath the recorder for the lead instrument to match the tranquil tone one might expect from a riverside location. The main boss 
boss theme that plays every time a boss is encountered is called Monster's Dance Rondo, which features an explosion of percussion mixed with the recorder, crumb horn, hurdy-gurdy, and daft for a tumultuous yet encouraging track that inspires the player to see every dangerous battle through to its end, with a nice B section that sees the recorder climbing higher and higher until it reaches a crescendo and begins to fall before beginning anew. Every time the player completes the fight, they'll approach the crystal tree with their empty chalice and fill it up with the gloriously translucent myrrh, which they use once they return home to bless the town's crystal and bring another peaceful year of protection. The song itself, Water of Life, is primarily psaltery and recorder-oriented, but my favorite part is when you collect a full chalice of myrrh and listen to the beautiful string composition as you and your party gaze at your tranquil reflection. It's also interesting that the end of year festival in which you review all of your memories has a jubilant piece known as Annual Festival, which shares a lead melody that can be heard in the harp section during the Water of Life song, which is a detail I only just noticed. My favorite track in the entire game might be the song that plays at Port Tippa, moving clouds on the river's surface. In spite of its simplicity, it conveys a relaxed, lackadaisical mood like the player is kicking back in the green grass and staring at the clouds slowly floating by, as the name might suggest. The song Overlooking the Great Ocean also shares an identical melody to Moving Clouds on the River Surface, but with a boglama for the string backing melody and a mute cornet and recorder for the lead wind, which lends an implication of grandiosity as the player prepares to go overseas and visit exotic and previously unavailable locations. Mars Pass is a tiny yet industrious city with two blacksmiths and a merchant, which marks the first time the player will truly have access to crafting outside of their hometown. But the song Echoes at the Mountain Peak invokes the idea of a moderately bustling civilization in spite of the cordoned off state of greater society. Once the player attempts to continue northward to explore more of the dangerous world, they'll be met with an extremely aggressive wall of miasma which will hamper their progress unless their chalice has the right element which allows them to pass. The area is nothing but a long, thin path of dead, dark soil, littered with abandoned weapons and a background full of insanely tall dead trees, with a track consisting of little other than pizzicato strings to convey a sense of peril and trepidation, with some robotically rhythmic and reverb heavy bass notes and synthetic glitch sounds to hammer home the point that one wrong move will surely result in your demise.
Altheteria song, Prosperity and Tradition, sounds like the manifestation of the biggest population in the game, with a similarly social aesthetic heard in Mars Pass, but with a more ambitious tone using a recorder and boglama as the lead instruments. Goblin Wall's theme, Shudder Monster, has a very mischievous sounding minimalistic tune with some occasional triangle hits, while the lead psaltery is tickled beneath the lead recorder as it trills and descends in a clumsy fashion, which makes for a goofy song which can quickly get grating due to the confusingly winding tunnels the player must take in order to make it through. Eventually a crumb horn accompanies the tracks before looping us back to the introduction. I don't like it that much, but I think it's charming how all of the instruments are given plenty of time to breathe and stand out. The Striped Brigands are a group of thieves who regularly attempt to rob and otherwise deceive the player, but their song titled If It's Three People starts with a tambourine before being led by the crumhorn and recorder, which rise in pitch before falling in a goofy fashion, as the chorus is a combination of a recorder and triangle, which helps paint the crew as a bunch of well-natured miscreants more than any actual villains. Eventually, the player will encounter an abandoned village known as Tida, where the narrator explains the tragic backstory. The villagers eagerly awaited their caravan's return, but for them, the crystal would never shine again. It is said that not a single one of them tried to escape. All stood fast, waiting for the caravan, hoping to the very end. The atmosphere is enhanced when you read some of the signs that describe the village's formerly sunny state, as well as one that supports the narrator's story about the villagers never faltering as they waited for the caravan's return. The track titled Eternal Oath is a pan flute playing a spiritless lead melody, with the ten drum leading some somber support later on in the song's quieter sections. This area is made more depressing when you find a love letter left in the trunk of a tree in the second area, which beckons an unknown recipient to meet there. When you mention it to an old man in Mars Pass, he seems distracted and bewildered, with a similar reaction resulting when presenting the letter to an old woman in the Selkie town of Luda. And after this point, should you return to the tree in Tida, you'll be met with a beautiful yet tragic ending, thereby concluding the love letter side quest, with your character finalizing the abrupt end with a poignant journal entry. Should you ever experience experience a game over, you'll be informed of the end of your journey with your village never seeing your return, which is chilling once you realize the fate to which this outcome would leave your family. Moshet Manor is a luxurious dwelling owned by Jack and Maggie, two regal monsters who employ a number of tonberries to do their bidding, including cooking and bookkeeping. But the music is a snooty and pretentious mixture of recorder and crumhorn to convey a sense of hedonistic overindulgence, with some gentle lute strumming to maintain the song's tempo, which makes for a very nice change of pace after facing death head-on in Tida. It has a warm, cheery, silly tone to it which adds a light-hearted atmosphere, combined with the humorous entry which shows Maggie throwing a tantrum as she impatiently awaits her dinner, while Jack does everything he can to arrange her meal as the tonberries slowly waddle into the kitchen, enhanced by Moshit Manor's song being titled, Maggie is Everything. <laughs> Thank you.
The level known as Vio Luce Luce, which controls the waterways of the world, is introduced with the song Promised Grace, a bombastic crumhorn cacophony with some tambourine and bongo drums with a lead horn melody that arranges in multiple harmonized layers to give a perilous yet celebratory tone to the entire piece. Later on in the song, most of the percussion, save for the shakers and the daff and a light triangle hit, are removed in order to emphasize the recorder, before all of the other musical layers come in together and loop back around to the introduction. It's also interesting that after year five, the river will all but dry up, and if the player wants to gain back their boat transportation abilities, they have to head back and cast a raise spell on the pump plants to restore proper aqueduct functionality, or just wait a few years for it to unclog naturally. One of my favorite songs in the game, A Gentle Wind Blows, plays when you visit the fields of Fum, where the human, or clavet race, live out their days. It's a relaxing little piece with lots of plucked strings and wind instruments, establishing it as an extensively peace-filled paradise, where striped apples and livestock thrive. People might also recognize this sort of musical style as the theme of Burna Village from Monster Hunter Generations, which conveys a similar sense of organic life mixed with tranquil nostalgia, using string instrumentation with appropriate vibrato to emulate the affect of a human voice with just a hint of beautiful sadness. As the player progresses outward into the sea, they'll encounter a volcanic location known as Mount Kalanda, where the song Something Burns in the Heart plays. It's a pretty standard song using the daft for percussion and a portative organ, crumhorn, hurdy-gurdy, and recorder for the lead melody, but it successfully accomplishes the oppressively overbearing atmosphere that comes from being mere meters away from an active pit of lava. <laughs> The player will eventually need to make their way towards Luda, the home of the Selkies. It's here that you will quickly realize, if you're perceptive enough, that every character with whom you speak will secretly pickpocket you, leaving you with gradually less skill than you had coming in, as Selkies are commonly known for being little more than pickpockets or thieves. The song Leaving the Body Freely is mainly Renaissance guitar with some recorder, but it's technically progressive classical music being played in 7 8 time signature, lending a nice sense of camaraderie and exotic danger to the track. Adjacent to Luda is the Lunari Desert, with a track titled Sleeping Treasure in the Sand, with the song name itself being a hint to the fact that the player needs to pay attention to all of the poems previously composed by Gertie, a mysterious vagrant who regularly requires your help throughout your adventures. His poems will hint that you need to cast magic on certain objects in the desert in order to progress forward to the boss, but more importantly, it's how you'll get the mystery element, which can be used to traverse every miasma stream without worrying about backtracking, to get fire water, wind, or earth elements from specific dungeons, as well as allowing the player to access the final area of the game. The music itself is nothing to write home about, as it's just your usual desert jig with some really shrill and elongated recorder that hurts my ears to listen to for long periods of time. But considering it's the most story-relevant dungeon in the entire game, it's still quite memorable.
Connell Kirik is one of my favorite tracks in the game, as it has a plottingly slow tempo with water droplet sounds and a whimsical yet sad lead recorder. It's said that this is where the Selkie home was originally, as hinted by the name Aiming Towards the New World, and this area is the key to a tragic questline centered around a Selkie named Denam, whom you meet in Shella, and he tells you he's interested in the possibility of portable crystals. Occasionally, he becomes more ambitious, as he'll soon write letters telling you about the possibilities of humans being able to rid the world of miasma, and his theories about why he thinks he could make it happen. Eventually, he'll begin writing you discouraged and increasingly disconcerting letters, and at one point he'll write to inform you that he's begun to consume the miasma-infected water in the hopes that he can build a tolerance, telling you that drinking the aforementioned water brings him great pain. Eventually, he'll write to you suggesting that you're closed-minded for doubting him, with the header spelling out that he's writing to you from Connell Kurek. If you head to his last known location, you'll make your way through an area before fighting a Sahagin, which, when killed, drops a bandana. Upon examining the article of clothing, it will mention it's inscribed with Denam's name. Some have speculated that this means he was eaten by a monster, but I think it's more likely he became a monster himself, since that makes the most sense judging from his prior letters, where it was clear that his mental state was rapidly deteriorating. But regardless, this side quest combined with the love letter quest earlier, this is a fucking sad game that really stuck with me throughout the years. Denam's story also reminded me strongly of the itchy tasty letter from Resident Evil 1, in which you'll read through a journal left behind by an umbrella researcher as he gradually transforms into a zombie before he'll emerge from a nearby closet and attack you. But yeah, really sad stuff to encounter in a Final Fantasy game. If you're into super dark stuff like that, check out Final Fantasy Tactics, as it touches on even darker subject matter which I will not spoil here. Eventually, the player will use the unknown element to enter the Abyss, which is where the final area resides. But I was incredibly surprised on my first playthrough to encounter a massive green creature which turns to face you before fleeing into the stream. As you advance onward and find a town known as Magmel, you'll be greeted with a song of the same name. It features a very uneasy combination of music box melodies with reverb-heavy piano notes and reverse noises, almost like something you'd hear in a creepy little girl's haunted playroom, to really convey the sentiment that this is the end of the Earth that has never before seen human contact. As you explore Magmel, it becomes apparent that the creatures here, which are actually carbuncles, portrayed much less cute compared to other Final Fantasy games, are afraid of your presence, as they hide away in their cocoons and attempt to evade you. Should you come back here every year, slowly but surely they'll begin to open up and speak to you, initially very afraid and reluctant, but eventually explaining the many mysteries of the world's backstory. I won't show it here in case any anyone wants to explore that for themselves, but I love games that inject hidden enigmas that reward the player for investing a lot of time into it in order to experience the gradual payoff. Like, I can just imagine so many people coming to Magmel and being like, oh, there's these creatures and they're sleeping and they won't talk to me. Oh well, I guess I'll never come back here again. I could explore a little more about the game, but for now I think I'll leave it there. Despite the botched multiplayer and the long loading times, I think it's still a perfectly serviceable game for anyone who's never experienced the original on GameCube. It's not the best Final Fantasy game on the market, nor is it the most fun to play, but it's a thoroughly enjoyable experience that I'm glad I was able to relive along with my group of friends. If you want to check it out, apparently the Switch version is the most optimized, with the PS4 version having longer loading times. But if you're into trophy completion, then go for it. Even though it doesn't have enough trophies to include a platinum. Anyway, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Bye.